singing by the way. That what a change from that first time, that first verse we were singing, and then that second, that second, and then the, even the third time singing those verses. Uh, a big change, big change in how we were singing. It was definitely noticeable. Great job, and uh, let's go ahead and let's take our Bibles. This evening, what we're going to start okay, is on. All right. It's on. I heard. Okay. So, let's take our Bible, sorry, to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12 this evening. Uh, we're going to go to a few different portions of Scripture, but we'll start off there. In Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at the first two verses. <laughs> So tonight, we're going to be looking at sacrifices, and uh, really looking at, really actually, the correct sacrifice, the correct sacrifice, and having a correct sacrifice. I think we've seen a few times in Scripture, which we're going to look at tonight. There's more than just those a couple of times uh, we're going to look at, but there's definitely some times that we have the incorrect sacrifice. And we see the incorrect sacrifice, and they're both in the Old Testament, but we're able to apply those to us today making sure that we ourselves have the correct sacrifice. So uh, follow along with me as I read Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at the first two verses, and then uh, we'll pray and begin to the message this evening. The Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the time we have to be here, Lord, in your house. And we have this time we have to be here in your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you will be able to just speak through me tonight, Lord, be able to have your word stand alone this, this evening, Lord. Put me aside, Lord, put my words aside. Just speak through me. Have your word stand here tonight. Lord, I pray that we, as we look at sacrifice in the Bible, Lord, that we will be able to walk away with knowing what the correct sacrifice is, and Lord, and what an incorrect sacrifice is. I pray you be with us now. Be with the children downstairs, Lord, in their lesson tonight, and across the way, Lord, in the fellowship, all the teenagers. Lord, I ask that your will be done in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now if you can, take your Bibles. We're going to go over to Genesis. Genesis chapter 4 be the first one we're going to look at tonight. And don't worry, we'll be coming back to Romans chapter 12 later on in the message. But the first one I'd like to look at tonight is, in the correct sacrifices, is, this is what was required. And really still is required, but we're going to look at past tense here in the Old Testament, what was required, and that was a sacrifice of blood. A sacrifice of blood in Genesis chapter 4, here, if I didn't tell you already, I'm sorry. Genesis chapter 4, we're going to look at the first five verses. The Bible says this, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. And she said, me, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of ground. And in process of time and came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the, of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. We see here the wrong sacrifice. See, this sacrifice, it was of flesh. But it was not of what we would say the flesh of bison and a burnt offering and a, a blood offering, the sacrifice like his brother Abel did. You see, Cain, his sacrifice was of himself, his flesh. Now, I'm not saying he was sacrificing his flesh, giving his flesh to the Lord, and the Lord to take me, use me. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is he gave the Lord a sacrifice of what he was able to accomplish, not what the Lord was able to accomplish through him. And see, when he gave this sacrifice, I fully believe 
that came as he tilled the ground, he brought forth the he brought forth the best fruit that he had. He brought forth the best looking vegetables. They weren't eaten up with worms or anything like that. He brought forth the best of that he had. The best of the best. Now, I, I do, I firmly believe that. That is not what God required of him. The reason why Abel's sacrifice, God had respect for, it was because it was what was required of him. It was of blood. A blood sacrifice was needed for the mission to send blood has to be shed for the remission of sin. And this is not something we can't even make the excuse that, well, you know, maybe they didn't know. They, they, were, they were children. We can't make that excuse. For one, I, I, I think, if y'all think along with me, and I believe the Lord gave us right to use it for a reason, I'm sure they've seen their, their dad make a sacrifice. I'm sure, I'm sure their mom and dad probably told them how, geez, how God came down and made the first sacrifice. Now, I'm sure they were taught, and actually, if you continue reading, even the next couple of verses, it shows us that he did know. Because God confronted him and said, why? 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 Basically, why are you mad at me? You knew what you know, you're you know what's required of you. We can be so much like Cain in this way of sacrificing of the... Let me see if I can make sure I word this right. Sacrificing of ourselves in the way, not of ourselves as in, Lord, I'm giving my life, I'll surrender to you. But I'm saying the sacrifice of ourselves is, you know what, Lord? I, I want to I give this to you. When the Lord's saying, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want this. You ever have the uh, conversation with your child or grandchild? And let's say you're at McDonald's. I'll give you an example here. All right, you have McDonald's, and you're sitting down with your son, your daughter, whomever, and you ask them for a fry. Now, you don't need their fry, right? You can go buy your own fries if you want a fry. But you ask them for a fry, and it's mainly because you want to see what they're willing to give to you. You want to see if they, if that connection they have with you. And they ever offer you something else instead? Maybe they really like fries, and they had chicken nuggets. They're done with their chicken nuggets. They offer you a nugget. No, it, is a nugget better? Well, in my mind it is. You know, I, I like nuggets better than a fry to me. All right? But that is not what was asked. Okay, right? We can kind of do the same thing with our lives. God asks of us for one thing. And we go to give him something else. And it's basically to satisfy our flesh of saying, yeah, we, we sacrificed. We gave to the Lord. But that's not what God asks for you to give him. Blessed sacrifice was the correct sacrifice. That's what was needed. And we see in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, actually, you don't have to turn there. I'll turn there. The book of Hebrews, though, the Bible does tell us in the, uh, chapter 10, the first uh, six verses, it talks about uh, why we had animal sacrifices. And of course, if you read all the way down to verse 10, uh, we have verse 10 there. It says, by the which we were all, uh, excuse me, we were, we, let me back up. By the which we will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. This is telling us that we no longer, this is why we don't have animal sacrifices anymore. A blood that was, uh, uh, blood needed to be shed was still required for our salvation. Just like then, if that sacrifice, it was still required, and it still is required, but Jesus Christ is the one that paid it all. So when we look back at Cain, he did not have the correct sacrifice. That's why God did not have respect on his sacrifice. It was not correct. It was not what was, he, what was required of him. And he knew of what to give to the Lord. Let's look at our next one. The sacrifice of the flesh. And what I mean, this, it, it's, I, I title it, it's very similar, but it's different. This one's of disobedience. So let's take our Bibles. Go to 1 Samuel. Right. 1 Samuel, we'll spend a little time here. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And I know most of us probably know this story, and they know we know what happened with King Saul. But we're going to go ahead and read it here tonight and look at a few things. First Samuel chapter 15, starting there in verse 1, the Bible says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken, un 
uh, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Emelech did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Emelech and utterly destroy all they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tilium, 200,000 footmen, and ten thousand men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Now, we know what's going to happen here for one. Let's make sure we all have the same mindset here to help us uh, get back on track of what we're thinking of. Saul was just made king. He was just now made king. So he is now the new king of Israel. And he's been given this great task on the Amalekites, Amalek. And we see all throughout the Old Testament how the war between the children of Israel and the Amalekites and Amalek. And how God told us even back in Exodus when, it, when they laid wait for the children of Israel coming out of Egypt that God was going to destroy them. God tells us that. And here, Saul has the opportunity to do it. Not only does Saul have this great opportunity for one, to obey the Lord, but two, think about it, he is just now king. He's been given this great charge. He now has a great opportunity to set his presence of the type of king he's going to be to the children of Israel. Of going to battle, being victorious. These are things that he has. But, as we see here, it's read, he was told to destroy everything. And as I said, no story, he did not destroy everything, did he? No. He saved the king, Agag, the best of the sheep, the, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs. He saved the best of them. And now skip down to verse 13. This is after all that happened. Now Samuel is coming back to the scene. Verse 13. The Bible says this, it says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the command of the Lord. Do you hear the confidence kind of in his voice of what he has done? Mm -hmm. yeah. This is of, uh, this is why I've titled it kind of of the flesh. Look at me. Look at what I've done. I've done it. Knowing good and well, he did not. Do exactly what was said. Amen. Remember, partial disobedience is full disobedience. Verse 14, the Bible says, And Samuel said, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? And the lowing of the oxen which I hear? This Samuel's calling him out. Have you ever done that to your child? You know, Titus, did, did you eat a piece of candy? No. Chocolate on his Got a little something right there. Dirt. Yeah. You, know, you know what I mean? I mean? You've done that before, I'm sure. If you haven't done it yourself, you've maybe seen someone else do it, or maybe it will come to you. Okay? But you remember those things. Samuel's doing the same thing. So, <clears throat> greet Samuel. Wow, look at what I've done. Look at this great thing I've accomplished. And Samuel knows he's probably not in his head. He goes, What's that uh, sound of, 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 of bleeding lambs in the back? What is, what is that, Saul? Here's Saul's excuse here. Verse 15. And Saul said, They have brought them, notice that they have, not him, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen, as we end of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. That almost sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. I would say that almost sounds like that he's religious a little. Maybe the term we would use today. It does. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't do it exactly like, the, like you said, but it's because this is the Lord. It's almost like, and I know I mentioned this terrible subject, but it's like tithe. God requires 10%. You give God 
five. Hmm, that's not fully what he asked of you. Oh, oh, but but yes, Lord, I only gave you five percent, but the other five percent, you see, I'm using it because Pastor asked if we could maybe raise some money for a building farm. Maybe we could raise some money for the playground, or, or you know, we needed some tires on the on the van. So uh, he asked about it, and, and I want to give towards that, Lord. That is not the same. That is not your time. The Bible is very plain on that. That is your offerings. That is above and beyond your tithe. When you go through those things, God may put those things in your heart. But it's different than your tithe. And that's basically kind of what Samuel is doing here. I know you have told me to utterly destroy this. And I have, but I kept the best because I want to sacrifice it to the Lord. That's not what God's asking of you, Samuel. Oh, oh, excuse me, Saul. So Samuel reminds Saul what the Lord told him to do. Let's get down now to verse 20. The Bible says, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of the Mount, of, me, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Verse 23, I'm sorry. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the, Lord, the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from me. What a, we would say, what a punishment. Obedience is so much more important than what he thought was good to the Lord. If you notice, for one, he shifted the blame. Because the people are not going to tell the king what to do. That's, I'm not sure if you remember back in history, but that's not how that works. Kings did not take that very well. I'm not saying Saul was this evil king right from the get-go of things. But they all knew what was required of a king. They all knew when they had a king, they weren't going to push the king around to tell him what to do. They wanted a king so they were told what to do. So but he quickly shifts that blame. And if you actually read that next verse... Uh, right here, I think this is a little extra. This is the difference between Saul and David right here. Because the fact of the matter is, Saul did terrible and corrupt things. But really, so did David. David, we would say, did terrible things. Yeah. He was corrupt. Yeah. He was sinful. But this is what the difference that made him a man after God's own heart. Verse 24, it says, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. In thy words. If there was a period right there, it would, his whole, his, the rest of his, we would say, his career of being king would have been completely different. But it doesn't. If we keep reading, it says, Because I have feared the people and obeyed their voice. Once again, he didn't fully repent. Lord, I sinned, I'm sorry, but I only did it because of them. And we, we think in our heads, that's so childish, isn't it? Mm -hmm. you know, point the finger, you know, oh, I don't know this, isn't it? But I encourage you to think back in yourself, how often do we do that to the Lord? Mm -hmm. Right. See, the difference between Saul and David here, David was a good repenter. When he sinned, he fell on his face before the Lord and he confessed his sin. He wasn't shifting blame. That was a little extra there for you. But, see, Saul had the wrong sacrifice. Let me go back up to verse 23. It says, For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. Now, why, why does Samuel say that? Well, for one, rebellion, rebellion and witchcraft, they are two different things. When we think about the actual definition of what they are, 
but rebellion is connected, right, to witchcraft, yes. But he says that because that's exactly what he was doing. See, Saul was taking the best of the best. And when you read it, before, uh, read, read before they actually went and took, his first idea, his first thought was not for sacrifice to the Lord. He wanted the best of the oxen, the sheep. He wanted it for himself. And then when he was going to decide to sacrifice it, he was going to sacrifice because he was going to sacrifice this great best, this, this huge amount. And I'm going to wow, look what, look what Saul sacrificed to the Lord. You see, that pride and that in there, that's what we call, it was, it was rebellion. And see, we actually see this all across America today. All across our churches. And it's not just, uh, we would maybe say, uh, New Age type churches. No, no, no. Even in Baptist churches, we see this. You know, there's too many churches out there that are missing the mark. And yes, I think we would even say, of course, the New Age churches, the way we maybe refer to them as the party churches sometimes. Yes, it's very obvious to them, but you know, most of those people have come from good independent fundamental Baptist churches. And what it is, is they want to serve the Lord. But now, as they're 30 and 40 year olds, they want to also do what they want to do and they weren't allowed to do. That's why they have such things as Christian rock and Christian rap. How those go together, I don't know. Mm. That's why they have those things. Do you know, actually, most of your contemporary Christian music artists don't even try to hide the fact that they have no desire to be saved, right. nor are they saved. Mm -hmm. They don't even hide it anymore. They, used to, they at least used to hide it. They're no better than Saul. You know, there's churches today, there's actually there's a tattoo church. And their mission statement is <coughs> tattooing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the middle of a service, they'll do the, the guy with the, the preacher will do a tattoo as he's preaching. And I know that sounds ridiculous. And it should sound ridiculous. Amen. Amen. But it is. It's yep. happening. And I don't know, I mean maybe they're getting tattooed John three sixteen on their <laughs> on their arm here, and then whenever they're walking in town they should go. <sighs> Spread the gospel. I don't know. I don't really know. I don't know. I don't know if that's how it works or what how how it actually works. Okay? And maybe people with Gloria say it that way. Not most likely. I, I, I know for a fact actually. My Bible tells me different. But the thing is, these people and they're fully believing this, but why? Why 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 do they why would even this come and dawn on a person thinking me doing this is spreading the gospel? Well, see, because they weren't allowed, and their children growing up in a kind of fundamental Baptist church. And now they see a way to do that, and in their eyes, they're giving it to the Lord. This is their sacrifice they're giving to the Lord. It is a rejected sacrifice. See, the Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28, Ye shall not make any cuttings on your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. And yes, I know that is Old Testament. And that may be your argument that's Old Testament. But I'm just saying, Old Testament tells us a lot about how God feels. That's right. See, the sacrifice here is a rejected sacrifice. It is not the correct sacrifice. This is not what God is asking of us. This is not the sacrifice God is wanting from us. Especially when we are, just like Saul, doing a direct disobedience to God's word. See, just like Saul, he was told to utterly destroy everything. And he didn't. And he kept that back the best. And he was going to sacrifice it to the Lord. But you're in direct disobedience to God. 
So therefore, you are no longer serving God. You are serving the flesh. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, also tells us, and I believe the book of Luke, I may be wrong on that, and maybe the book of John, but it tells us twice throughout the Gospels for sure that you cannot serve two masters. You either serve God or you serve man, or you'll either, you'll either hate the one or you'll love, you'll love the other, or basically vice versa. I'm paraphrasing, of course. You can't do both. You know why you may grew up not knowing it was wrong for you to get a tattoo? Because God tells us that's why. But we are confusing with giving certain things to the Lord. This is my sacrifice to the Lord. This is what I want to do for Him. When He's told you directly not to do that. It's the same thing with music. I'm not going to preach on music tonight, even though I, I would love to sometimes. The Bible tells us a lot about music. One of the number one things we see in music, for one, we know the devil is the father of music. And he uses it still to this day. Secondly, we see in Scripture that one of the most important things is that music teaches you. It teaches you. The Bible talks about music in in several places because it's important to God. And when we go directly against what he tells us on that, and we're giving it to the Lord, that is a rejected sacrifice. We're no better than Cain. We're no better than Saul. <clears throat> Lastly, let's go back to our text this evening. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. As you're turning there, I'll read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies of living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the correct sacrifice. This is what he has asked for us to do. And realistically, it's, it's not much. What he's asked for us to do is to live for him. He has not asked you to die for him, even though that you see throughout scripture there's martyrs, and you know throughout history of several people that were martyred for their faith. But that is not what he has asked of us. What he's asked of us is to live for him. And the thing is, when it says holy acceptable unto God, holy is meaning set apart. Even right there in the second verse it says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Now, does that mean we, I don't mean this mean, but does that, does, that, does that mean we have to look like the Amish and how the Amish act and be no electricity and things like that? That's not what, that's not what the Bible's talking about. That's not what it means. It just doesn't, it doesn't mean to be, uh, to be transformed in that way. Transformed here would be another word of what we would call uh, lose the word right when I'm fixing to say it. Uh, metamorphosis. That's what we call it. Metamorphosis is what the word is for. In science, you learn about metamorphosis, right? You think about a caterpillar, how a caterpillar grows and it's eaten, and then it goes into a cocoon, and then after it's in the cocoon, it comes out, and it comes out to be hopefully a pretty butterfly, not a moth. <laughs> right? So, that is metamorphosis. That's the transforming. And that's what I was talking about here. It's like a metamorphosis. It's a transforming. It's a change. And see, we should have that change. We accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. We have that change. We are now different. But the very first part of that second verse, be not conformed to this world. We don't act like the world and be like the world to reach the world. Now, we meet people where they're at. Yes. Does not mean we become them. It's a difference. And see, in our living sacrifice, what God has asked of us to do is to live for Him, and not just in one thing. He's asked for us to live for Him in our lives. Now, I don't know about y'all, but when I think about that, when He asks us to live for Him in our lives, that means our lives. That doesn't mean on Sundays and Wednesdays I go to church. Which, yes, it's important to go to church. We see that in Scripture, but that's not what that means. 
It means Monday through Sunday, living for God. Right. Or really, Sunday through Saturday. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sunday through Saturday. Right? We live for God in our walk, in our talk, the way we live our lives, the way we act. The Bible talks about our conversation. The Bible, does, when the Bible says conversation, I believe it says it in uh, 1 Timothy 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 12. Right? And it talks about, uh, let's see, be thou an example. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example. And it mentions conversation. You know, conversation is not talking about our words. Because it also mentions words there. You know, conversation, and throughout several times in Scripture, that word actually means like our demeanor, our behavior. That's what it means. We need to be a living sacrifice in all areas of our life. God wants you to give Him your all. God wants you just to live for Him. <coughs> Spread the gospel. Tell others about what Jesus has done for you. That's what God is asking of us for our sacrifice. Why? To be living proofs of what God can do. Now how do we do this? By the renewing of our minds. It says right there in the verse. We have to reset our minds. Because you know what? There's sometimes there's things that don't make sense to us. There's sometimes things we don't like to do. But God has told us to do. God has asked us to do. Sometimes it goes against our flesh and what we want. It does. I'll be the first person to tell you that. But I know it's what God wants me to do. It's what God has asked me to do. What it's commanded me to do. So tonight, are you correcting your sacrifice? Or are you giving God a rejected sacrifice? Wanting to give him this, and maybe have all good intentions, just like Cain. I'm sure Cain had great intentions. I think even Saul had good intentions. But they were incorrect. They were rejected sacrifices. That is not what God has asked of you. That's not what God has asked of you. Are you giving God the correct sacrifice? Let's stand. I have a word of prayer and time of invitation. Dearly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, the time we have to be here. The time you blessed us with, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for just being plain to us, Lord. Lord, we know you're not the author of confusion. Lord, we know we don't have to worry about knowing and not knowing what you're asking of us. Lord, I thank you for being so plain to us in your word and telling us exactly what you want. Lord, I ask now that you'll be with us be this time of invitation, Lord. I pray that we will always give you the correct sacrifice in what you've acquired and what you've asked of us. Be with us now in Jesus' name. Take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 232, When I See the Blood. Altar is open.